Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for this day, thanking you for the wonderful opportunity that it is to be able to spend time together as your people, to be able to fellowship one with another, to be encouraged by one another, and to study your word tonight as we're going to do in our class. We're so thankful, Father, for our health and thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. We come before you tonight, Father, in a very special prayer upon those that truly need prayers. For Connie Dixon, as she's at home, and we pray, Father, that as she is facing these these uncertain times, that she will be comforted and that her faith will be strong inside of you. We pray, Father, for all of those that are helping take care of her as they know what they are facing. And we pray, Father, that they will be comforted and they will be strengthened in her final days. And we pray, Father, that she will, as she has for her life, continue to be faithful in you. We're so thankful, Father, for her example, for her willingness to never give up and her willingness to always put you first. Very special prayer for her, Father. We pray for Barry Alsop as he has been facing cancer and doing cancer treatments and pray that he will continue to do well. Pray for Stacy McCormick as she has had some complications and as they're kind of pausing and watching her with the treatments now, we pray that those treatments will be successful and that they will continue to keep the plan that they have and that they'll be able to eradicate that cancer from her body as well. We pray, Father, for Fagan Sneed as as there's been a stroke, and we pray, Father, as the long-term care facility helps with him, the rehab facility, that he will be able to continue to do well and as he needs that much-needed care as the future faces. We're so thankful, Father, for our health. We pray, Father, that we recognize every day the true opportunity that every day is. To have an opportunity once again to live for you, to have an opportunity once again to learn more of you, and to be able to be among others, Father, of this world, and have an influence on them, and to be able to live in a world that's full of wickedness, and to be shining lights as you've commanded us to be. We pray, Father, that as we're here, we'll be thankful, and we will recognize the true blessing it is to be among your people, to open up your book, and to be able to spend a portion of our time tonight together. We're thankful for all those that prepared for tonight, for our teachers in the back, and for all the lessons that are being presented tonight. We're thankful for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When we finished last week, we had watched our first of three clips from the uh, Garland Elkins segment on the Phil Donahue show. Um, There are two more that are about two minutes apiece that I want you to be able to see. So what we'll do for us, we'll be able to see those. But for those online, um, we will not for certain reasons uh, distribute those online. So they will be blocking that out. Um, And we'll get to those in just a moment. But what I want you, and there's a reason I've asked us to to see these, because we're in this this middle section here, the last tail section of our um, church discipline handout. we're getting ready, and we'll start this section tonight. What happens when corrective discipline doesn't work? When, what happens when one of us, a Christian, continues to dwell in sin? And I believe that through our class we've talked about the responsibility that we all have to each other. I believe we've covered thoroughly the responsibility that we do have to know the truth and to make our lives right with the Lord. I believe we have talked about the responsibility that we have as examples in the Lord's church. I believe so far we've talked about a lot of personal responsibility, but now we're entering in the section that really prompted us in all of this, and and we spent time last week, and this was part of what we did, half of our class last week, uh, watching this particular scene or segments from this show that was a talk show talking about a case where a lady was withdrawn from. She was caught in fornication, and she was living in that fornication. She refused to repent. She refused to make it right, and the church withdrew from her publicly, and she sued the church. Now, long term short, she did not win. The court over, uh, initially sided with her, but long term short, they overruled that uh, judgment. But what happened inside of this, and this is what I want you to see, I want you to see how the public viewed this. He kept asking, why are you expelling her from the church? 
He kept saying, weren't you so embarrassed for what took place? They kept talking about the fact that the law of Christ was not more important than the law of America. At least that's what the lawyer said. And she decided to say that she was one who quit the church, so they needed to leave her alone. Now, we saw some of the crowd reaction to that. They didn't like that. Now, there's a reason I've asked us to look at that. Because when this happens, and I'm telling you again, I pray it never does. But when this happens, the public and others will react. And we've noticed some of those things. The final two clips that we'll have will address um, some of those things, and we will watch those things back to back. Hopefully, um, we can get everything to work the way we need to. Um, but we'll watch those two clips. One is about two minutes, and the other is uh, right around two minutes and a half. So we'll look at those two things, we'll discuss them, and then what we will do is we will start in the when and how section of our book. So we'll start those two now.
And not everybody at once. <laughs> yes, it is. There you go. Okay, there you go. You, know, you notice what Brother Elkins did. What else did you notice? That's right. That's right. He, he at least recognized that. What else did you notice? The reactions, and that's what I wanted you to see. Okay, everything we do is noticed. And how we do is noticed. Did you see how she perceived what was done? Well, they sat outside and watched my house. They came to the laundry mat where I was. Nothing was, and she said, was convenient for me. Perception. Everything that we, everything that we do is perceived in some light. In many cases, this was different. Did you notice, and this is what you mentioned, that Garland Elkins had a scripture for everything that came up? Did you notice that? Okay, good. Did you notice that at the end, uh, he was preparing to quote a scripture, and Phil Donahue said, yes, the preacher, the minister is going to have a scripture for everything. And he said, do you have one about hiding in the bushes? Perception, folks. Perception. That's what I'm trying to get you to see tonight. Everything we do has a reaction now. Did you notice the lawyer, what he said? Any group or cult? Hmm. How was the church being perceived? The church was being perceived as a cult. Now, here's a question. Just because perception could go in a negative way, does that mean we abandon what we're supposed to do? No. I believe what this does is it does teach us that everything that we do is going to be perceived in a multitude of different ways. Now, you know this. How many, we, we've talked about this in this class. How many people in here have an opinion? Every one of us. And we probably perceive things in different ways. And so does the court of public opinion. Everybody has an opinion and we saw that, I think, distinctively, especially when he said, the minister has a scripture for that. Do you have one about hiding in the bushes? And all the people laughed. And I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. And, I'm not, and I am not teaching this to say to our elders, don't hide in the bushes. But everything that we do is perceived at that. I don't know if they hid in the bushes or not. I would like to suggest they didn't, but I don't know. I cannot speak to that. I would like to suggest that every eldership would be smarter than that. But who can make mistakes? That's right. That's right. I agree, I agree with you, but I'm not going to say it out loud. <laughs> so here, here's what we need to know. Everything we do matters. Now, what happens when corrective church discipline does not change? Now listen to the way I'm wording this. The sinner. Church discipline is not for the saint. It is for the one who is in sin. Now we've talked about what this sin is. It's not just a, a mistake that is going to be corrected and moved on from. This is something that someone is habitually and over and over and over in their lives living in. Big difference in those two. Because how many of us could commit sin right now? Okay, that's not what we're talking about. Also, in that same question, how many of us could repent tonight if we committed sin tonight? Every one of us. There's a big difference in that statement in saying who's going to live in a sin tonight. Big difference inside of that. So, here's what we've got to... We're going to talk about that. As we go through our class, we will talk about that. So I don't want to jump ahead or I'll confuse myself. But we will, we will answer that, I assure you, as we go through, um, especially as we get into um, the passages to rely on section and toward the back, the end of our class, the what is our attitude. We should finish this class up next week as well. So this is where we're at. So, so here, here's where we're at right now. I've catered tonight's class to us. Now, understanding a couple of things. Not every congregation has elders. 
That's true, isn't it? Does every congregation of the Lord's church have elders? They don't all have elders. Now, we can be scripturally unorganized or scripturally organized. Now, we are scripturally organized. There are occasions where there are churches where there are not men who can be elders, and that's understood in Scripture. Not that I'm aware of, no, no, because every congregation is, and this was, this was brought up in these uh, videos, and Phil Donahue, matter of fact, made sure this was said, that the churches of Christ are autonomous. In other words, we operate independently from one another. So I would never suggest that the East Hill elders go to another congregation and try to shepherd, because then what's happening? You're violating Scripture, but what, what, what are you doing? You're at the wrong flock. And, and that's a big deal to look at. So, so I'm catering this tonight to you and me because we are in a congregation that is scripturally organized. Therefore, who is in the leadership position of East Hill? The elders are. Therefore, where do we defer? We defer to the elders. Now, if there were not elders... Would that mean we just didn't we just we got to ignore this principle? No, we'd still have to deal with it, wouldn't we? And, and I think that's different. I think the men of the congregation would have to deal with this inside of the scene. So First Timothy three one through seven, we won't look at that. Titus one five through nine, we won't look at that. The elders; those are the qualifications of an elder. We understand that congregations should have elders, and therefore they should be the men that lead. But I do want us to look at Acts twenty, Acts twenty verse twenty eight, Acts twenty verse twenty eight. Now, this is the passage that's written to elders, Acts 20, 28. reads this way, Therefore, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, a couple of things we need to recognize. Who purchased the church? Christ did, don't forget it. Who died for the church? Christ did, don't forget it. But who is to feed the flock of God? Who is to ensure that they are spiritually fed? The elders. There are many ways that that takes place. That takes place right now, doesn't it? I'll tell you, this class is under the headship of the elders. I may be teaching this class, but I assure you, if they wanted it to change directions, it would. Same thing with our classes in the back. Should the elders know what's going on in the other classes? If they're to feed the flock, should they know what's going on in the flock? All right. Now, one of the things I believe that's true happens here in Acts 20, verse 28. Two things take place. Number one, what is the elder supposed to do? First question. He's an overseer, but what is he supposed to... What are the two areas of which he oversees? There are two areas in Acts 20, 28. Number one, themselves. Number two, the flock. Why does an elder need to be concerned about his life? That's right. That's right. I, I like to answer that question this way because he's an elder. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 1, 5 through 9. Are there not distinct and exclusive qualifications of elders. Can every man be an elder? No. Can... Let's just see if you know the qualifications of an elder. Can a single man be an elder? All right. Can a man with no children be an elder? Can a man who has a temper be an elder? A uh, man who, let's see, does not have his household in order? A man who does not have, phrase this correctly, Christian children who are faithful? Well, the word child there in, in that particular passage is only referring to children as a whole. Um, I have never been one who is taught that it has to be multiple children. Um, a child, that's, that's the word that's used there. Um, and that's the way I always look at that. I agree with that. I do. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with that. I do. 
I, I agree, I agree, but does he have children? Okay, we get it, we get it. You know, and what, what's the first qualification in 1 Timothy 3? If a man desire the office of a bishop, there you go, a lot of men don't want to be, which here's a good thing for men, especially men who are younger, aspire to be an elder. I know classes like this probably don't make us say, I want to do that. But we need to aspire to be elders. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's a lot of debate about that question. Um, there's a lot of debate about that question. Um, I have always done it this way. When they're under your roof, when they're under your authority, and they're under your authority. That's how I have always looked at that passage. Now, I know there are a lot of folks who look at that different. There are some folks who look at it a lot looser than I do, and I don't look at it any looser than that. But you are responsible for those that are under your authority. And that's why I often, and there's a reason I go with that, an elder, as we talked about just a minute ago, is not responsible for Christians in another congregation, just as much as a father is not responsible for every action a child does outside of his roof. I've always looked at it that way. And I'd love to study more about that if you would like to. Serious yes, sir. Have no, sir. They have a pope. They have bishops. They have... Somebody help me out. <laughs> Cardinals. That was the one I was thinking of. They have everything but elders and deacons. Now, Scripture is very plain. Elders, deacons, ministers... I'm going to include this one because we always, we, we, we generally leave it out. Missionaries and members. Those are your main divisions of the body of Christ that are found inside of Scripture. Uh, do you find a pope inside of Scripture? Since we asked the question, do you find a pope? Do you find a cardinal? Now, we got in the mail, I'll tell this funny little thing. We got in the mail a booklet full of pastoral and bishop robes. Well, we copied a copy of it off and folded it in an envelope and put it in Joe Christopher's box and said, we found you something. He laughed at it. Yes, sir. They have yeah. Yep. You know, that's right. That's right. You know, when you leave Scripture, you open yourself up to problems. When you leave Scripture, you open yourself up to problems. So, so here is where we're looking at. They take heed to themselves. They take heed to the flock. Now listen to how important this is. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. How important is it for the eldership to feed the flock of God? Vital. Vital to do that. Go with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3, 10. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5. I am so sorry. 1 Peter 5. I knew that didn't. I was looking at the wrong section. 1 Peter 5. All right, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. Now listen to how this is written. The elders which are among you I exhort. Now pause for just a minute. That's another reason why I suggest, I don't just suggest, I'm emphatic about it, of why one eldership cannot reach over into another congregation and supersede either A, the scriptural unorganization of that church, or B, the eldership that scripture organized at that church. The elders which are among you. The elders that are in that congregation of God's people. He says, I exhort whom I am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to all the flock. Now, I love verse 4. Add this to this. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Who are they being likened unto? The chief shepherd Christ. So there, there's, a, there's a great comparison there, but I want you to see some things. 
Number one, I want you to see what happens in verse one. What do we know about the man? Who, who wrote 1 Peter? Peter, it's not a trick question, but it sounds like a trick question, doesn't it? All right, what do we know about Peter in 1 Peter 5.1? All right, he's an elder, so what do we know about Peter? He is married, he has, and those children are faithful, married, they're, 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 that's right, they're Christians. Uh, anytime the word elder is used, it is used in a plural sense. There is never a singularity of men, and that sounds weird, but that's, that's the interesting way about it. There's never a single man who's over the church except who? Christ. Now, now that should tell us something. Christ did not want one man over every congregation. Why? Because men are, as we talked about just a moment ago, men are fallible. That's why you always see a multiplicity of men inside of the eldership. So you see Peter here. He is a man. And that's interesting. Can a woman be an elder? Boy, I know that's an unpolitically correct statement, but can she be an elder? Okay. Uh, the reason you haven't heard of one is because it's not biblical. Yes, sir. Two or more. Yes, sir. Yes. Dissolved. Yes. 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 That's right. That's right. Uh, matter of fact, where I worked at uh, while I was in school at Memphis, um, that had happened there. They had two elders. One of the elders passed away. You can't have a singular elder. Therefore, the eldership is dissolved. That's why younger men, older men, middle-aged men aspire to be elders aspire to be elders because there's something that we know how long are we going to live uh, we don't know and therefore the church must take care of the longevity of the church where do elders come from that's also in first peter 5 1 where do elders come from from among who you as first peter 5 1 talks about so here's peter there to feed the flock of god but i want you to see something Taking the oversight thereof. What does that mean? Being the leadership there. Elders are leaders. Elders are the leadership. The preacher will never be the leader of the congregation. Now, he may be the mouthpiece of the elders. He may be the one who is doing some of the feeding of the flock. But he is not doing it all. Should a preacher be an elder? Well, 1 Peter 5, 1. What was Peter? Peter was an elder. Peter was an apostle. And Peter was a preacher. I know of cases where it does happen. Um, matter of fact, I know within an hour distance of here, there's a man who, because of an elder passing away, agreed to step in for a certain amount of time until they could get someone else to fill that role. Now, now, can he do that long term? Yes, he can. And there are a lot of there are a lot of opinions. I agree whole I agree wholeheartedly with, with, with you on that. Um, here, let me let me ask a question. And, and law, I don't mean to open up a can of worms, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Is an eldership or is an elder a lifelong appointment? Is an elder appointed for the rest of his life as an elder? That's what I'm asking y'all. What if he no longer meets the qualifications? Okay, there you go, as long as he's qualified. Now, does that mean he has to serve for the rest of his life? Would there be anything wrong with a man saying, I'll serve for 10 years and then step down? That's right. That's right. I, I know a man right now in Sparta, Tennessee, who had been an elder all of my life, and he finally realized I need to step down. I was proud of him for that because he recognized he could no longer fulfill that appointment. 
So that, that, that's just a side note. I just want to keep it in mind. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying any of our elders should step down. I don't want that. I don't want that. But I just want to just keep it in our minds that it is not a lifelong appointment. That helps us younger men. What do we've got to aspire to be? Elders. Because we never know what's going to take place in the life of others. Hebrews 13, 7 will be our next passage. Yes, sir. Can a deacon qualify for an elder? Okay. Does one have to be a deacon to be an elder? No. If you go to 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 5, Titus 1, 5 through 9. If a man desire the office of a bishop, if he meets those qualifications, can he be an elder? The answer is yes. So he does not have to be an, a deacon, but he can be a deacon. Now, oftentimes, this is the way we look at it. I'll become a deacon, then I'll become an elder. Is that how it has to be? No. What does it have to be? Qualified. Yeah, I'm glad you used that word. That was the word I was going to use. Qualified. Now, you... Well, is he the husband of one wife? Is he the husband of one wife? He was. Yes, he was. Well, at death, what is separated? The bond of... Marriage. Is he now still the husband of one wife? I know of another situation. Matter of fact, where I grew up, a man who had been an elder all of my life, his wife decided to divorce him. Was he the husband of one wife? He stepped down. And I was just as proud of him for doing it too. Life happens, folks. And therefore, the church should sustain the church that's why God planned everything. You know, that's why God gave us His book. Do what? No, I'm, I'm just saying He was no longer married to her, therefore He stepped down. That's what I was trying to, to point out there. No, death is nowhere near the same as divorce. I don't, I don't want anybody to think that. Matter of fact, we're, we're in a class where I don't want anybody to think something that I didn't say. So if you think I said something, ask. I'd rather clear it up now than have to clear it up six weeks when I don't remember what I said. So let's clear them up now. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17. 13, 17. All right. This is the passage that Garland Elkins quoted. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, and that they must give an account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. What should we be doing for our elders? A lot, there's a lot that a congregation should do for its elders. What should we be doing? We should pray for them. That's right. That's right. What else should we do? Encourage them. Get along with one another. What else? Support them. I heard something. Obey them. That's a good one from Hebrews 13, 17. Yes. Yes. Respect them, and, and this, this is where I was trying to go. We should live the Christian life. We should live the Christian life. Did you know that your life can make it hard on the elders? We don't think that very often. Matter of fact, we usually don't think whether our lives can make anybody else's life hard, much less the elders. Everything we do matters. This goes back to what we've been talking about in the whole class. Yes. Matter of fact, I would suggest that if I ask Joe and Johnny, Joe Christopher couldn't be here tonight, but if I could ask Joe and Johnny if they wanted to do this again, I think their answer is no. Is that right? But I know if I ask them, will they do it again? The answer is yes. It's difficult. That's why this class has been difficult. The next is 1 Timothy 5, 19, then we can move from this. I want you to see this. This is, this is crucial. Somebody tell me the third word in 1 Timothy 5, 19. Elder, all right. Against an elder, receive not an accusation. Those are very strong words. 
Against not an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. What does the word witness mean? Someone that saw it happen. Is that someone who thought it happened? Is that someone who believed it could have happened? That's somebody that, that's right, knows it happened because they saw it and heard it. That's right, this is not hearsay. Matter of fact, that's how we should treat every Christian. That's how we should treat the world. Unless we've seen it, unless we've heard it, we don't know it. Matter of fact, I was told today of a preacher who has, I'm going to proverbially say it this way, gone off his rocker. And I did not want to believe it. But I went and watched it with my own eyes. And heard it with my own ears. I know it to be true. That's how we should treat everybody. But what do we know? The gossip train runs real fast, doesn't it? We wonder why the Lord warns us against gossip. Okay, so, elders in authority. Do elders have authority in the Lord's church? Yes. Okay, and we move on. This is where we've been trying to get this whole time. Passages to rely on. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Go there with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In fact, this is the area that really spawned this class, or part of the area that spawned this class. We have two minutes, by the way, two minutes. It's like, huh? You know, that's, if we would wake up every day and remind ourselves that without Christ we are not perfect, and without His Word we are left in a just terrible situation, we'd be better every day. But 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, pause there. All right. Paul is writing here. He says, now we command you. He's going back to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy in 2 Thessalonians 1, 1. Now we command you. What's a command? All right, now, let me ask you two questions about a command. Do I have to do it? Aha! Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to play a little bit of this devil advocate tonight. Do I have to do it if it's biblical? Now, here, here's question number two about a command. That's right. That's right where we're going. We understand commands. What would happen if you told your child to do something that didn't do it? Would they have obeyed you or not? That's right. I would too. Now, we command you... What's the next word? All right, now who is being commanded? The brethren are being commanded by Paul through who? Let's get specific. Through the Holy Spirit. Remember, inspiration through the Holy Spirit. Jesus told in John chapter 14 that he would send the Comforter, and the, com the Comforter would remind them of all things that he commanded them. The Holy Spirit's the Comforter. Inspiration's through the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is still an acceptable answer too. But let's just, let's just keep it what it is, the Holy Spirit. You and I are being commanded by God Himself to do what? Read on. Specifically here in the name of the Lord Jesus or by His authority, that ye withdraw yourselves from whom? From every brother that walketh disorderly, not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, what's going to happen here? is we will not be able to go any further than this. I'm, I'm glad this is a stopping point. What we will do is we will finish this section out next week. We will uh, finish this passage or line section rather quickly. We will consider three scenarios, what happens, or two scenarios, what happens in marriage if this happens, what happens when in parenting this happens, and then we will turn to our final page and ask this question, what is our attitude? Now that's going to be the biggest question that we have to ask in this study. And then what we will do after that, we will move into First and Second Timothy. 
we will go to Titus and, well, first and second Timothy. And after that, what we may do, um, we may go to the book of Romans in Wednesday night class. I'm still looking at some things. We may do Titus first. I'm just trying to decide how uh, that is going to work out. So thank you for your participation tonight. We'll finish right here um, next week. And then we will move into our next class in this particular room. Thank you so much.